Uh, the first speaker this afternoon is Amr Rahman. Amr Rahman is head of strategy at Fajr Capital Limited, a principal investment firm registered in the DIFC Dubai. He was formerly the global head of strategy for HSBC Amana, a worldwide business unit of the HSBC Group, serving over 300,000 customers in major markets of the Middle East, Asia, Europe, and the United States. At HSBC Amana, Rahman was responsible for strategy development across retail, commercial, and investment banking businesses across nine markets worldwide. Previously a consultant with the Boston Consulting Group, Rahman has advised clients in multiple industries regarding a wide range of strategic issues. Rahman is author of Dubai and Company, Global Strategies for Doing Business in the Gulf States, and Islamic Finance, A New Global Player, a piece in the February 2008 issue of the Harvard Business Review. He holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University, and a BA from Harvard College. In 2008, he was appointed an adjunct scholar at the Middle East Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based nonpartisan think tank established in 1946. Please join me in welcoming Amr. Thank you very much, Alex, and, and thank you all for having me here. As Alex told you, I'm basically a business person, which explains the, uh, the stuffy suit. Um, uh, but uh, I very much uh, feel privileged to be here with you today to discuss this region, uh, the Gulf region of the Middle East, and to understand a bit better how it could be integrated into the important work that you do here uh, in classrooms. And uh, I was telling Alex when I came that I wasn't sure if he was trying to call me uh, because I had lost my cell phone. Uh, so I lost my cell phone and I was telling him the story and he said, well, that's a good story you should tell, tell the group because I lost it in Dubai. Uh, I just came from Dubai. Um, I don't live in Dubai, I live in New York. Uh, but uh, if you ask my wife, she'll say I, don't, I live in airports um, or something like that. Um, but I, uh, so we were coming back and I lost my cell phone. And this morning, has been a busy morning for me because we had a bunch of calls. We're dealing with an investor who is a Saudi investor um, who is uh, we're negotiating with us some terms. So we've got our company, the Dubai-based company. We've got a Saudi investor. It's being advised by an English law firm. So there's work being done out of London. Uh, and then our legal counsel uh, is uh, principally based in Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur. So basically this morning, and this is pretty typical in, in business today, is that we had on this conference call, so there was myself in Chicago, my colleagues in London, uh, the lawyers in London, the lawyers in Dubai, the uh, lawyers in Riyadh, and the lawyer in KL. Uh, so it's, it's more and more transactions, more and more business is getting that, that globalized and that international, and I'm sure uh, you're hearing a lot of that uh, in, this, uh, in this conference that you're at. Um, here we go. So what I'll do is I'll speak a bit about the, the Middle East region, uh, particularly the Gulf region of the Middle East. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll uh, speak a bit about what makes it interesting from a global business perspective and how uh, there are some misconceptions about the region, there are some perceptions that aren't, aren't always accurate. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about from a business perspective how uh, companies go about operating in that region. But I'm not sure, to be honest with you, how much of that, oh, I want to make sure this is as interesting for you as possible. So before I get into that, I wanted to ask, uh, how many of you in your classrooms discuss the Middle East in any way? Basically, so almost everybody. Now, uh, if you were to ask your students uh, what, um, if you were to say to them, you know, we're, today we're going to talk about the Middle East, what, what topics or what terms might come to mind for them, do you think? Huh? What was that? War. Yeah? Yeah, keep going. That's a good one. Let me get, I'm just let me get write these down. Uh, Islam, yeah. Uh, yeah, Arab Israeli. Yeah. Sorry. Suez Canal. Okay. Taliban. Okay. Archaeology. Good one. Sorry? Sure. Food. That's a good one. OK, let me, that's a good one. Let me take, take this one. There's a, may I call it wealth distribution? 
Uh, and so, yes, I heard a gentleman. Okay. Uh-huh, and? Mathematics. mathematics. All right. Sure, let me just ask about mathematics. Is it, do, you, do you talk about mathematics in the Middle East? And algebra and things like that? Or in what context? They started with zero and basic Right. That's where math came from. Absolutely. It's interesting. I don't know if people heard that too. Uh, Ma'am, what's, ma what's your name, ma'am? Leslie. Uh, Leslie. So Leslie was talking about how the Arab world originated the concept of zero, uh, and then astronomy, and, and, and then also I added algebra. Uh, algebra is actually, comes from an Arabic word, al-jabr, which means to break things down. Uh, so break things down and bring them back together, that's algebra. Um, uh, OK, well, that's a good list. That's a good, and then what's interesting about this is uh, some of these are about business. But a lot of them aren't. So let's let's focus on the ones that are, or let's circle the ones that are about business. So we got oil, um, war. war. Interesting. <laughs> really? Okay. Let me put a dotted circle. All right. I'll take that. Um, wealth, obviously. That's a solid circle. The canal is definitely about business. Sorry. Alcohol, no. All right. Anyway, well, that's good. So what I want to start with is that when, when, people, you know, when people think about the Middle East, they don't really think about business, customarily, as, as, at least as the first set of thought. I mean, and, and it's the same with business people. So you know, a lot of times when I talk to business people about the Middle East, uh, clearly what the things that come to their mind are number one, war. So people say, well, is it safe? Can you really do business there, et cetera? So war is a very big theme. The Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, of course, is a very important question that people come up with and always raise. Um, the war in Iraq uh, is obviously also quite important. Uh, religion is discussed a fair bit. And there's some good intersection between religion and business, uh, particularly the field of Islamic finance, uh, in which I used to work with HSBC Amana. Uh, but nonetheless, that's an interesting theme. And then there are all these other, other points. Now, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to some of them here, but I think the main, the main thing is that when the Middle East is, is taught or discussed or, or um, reflected upon, customarily it's not from a business perspective, but rather more from a political or social perspective. And you know, we saw that here. I mean, if you look at the, the very famous uh, incident we had here with Dubai ports. Anybody remember the Dubai ports story? Yeah, the, do you, sir, do you remember what happened with Dubai ports? That's right. That's right. So as, as the gentleman is saying, that you know, we had sold, or there was a company that was called P&O, which is a ports operator. And they had sold their, uh, most of their business, actually all of their business, to a company based in Dubai called Dubai Ports World. And Dubai Ports World would then be taking over a bunch of ports worldwide, including some ports in the US. And uh, members of, so the Bush administration approved the, the transaction. Uh, and then some members of Congress raised objections. Uh, saying, well, and what's interesting about this is though the official uh, complaint, if you will, was should we have our ports managed by a foreign company? Which is an interesting and I think a very valid question. What was not said much is that the ports were already being managed by a foreign company, uh, which was P&O. The difference was it was a British company and not an Arab company. That was the first question. Uh, and, and, and then beyond that, then obviously there were a lot of discussions about this, this entity. Now, uh, p and oh, sorry, uh, Dubai Ports World was managing ports in Latin America. They were managing ports in Europe. They were managing ports in Africa. They were actually pretty good on the security side. But none of that was really thought about, at least in the, in the kind of general furor. So again, the imagery or the, or the sense was, well, this is an Arab company, and we don't want Arabs controlling our ports. Uh, so, I don't, so even in business, even in the regulation of things, I think most of the time people are not looking at commercial transactions, but they're looking at political and social concerns. So with that, let me get, get into... The, um, oh, another thing I would say is that you know, there, this is actually an opportunity. I mean, one, uh, one way that I think this might be relevant for you in your classrooms is that a different perspective on the Middle East or a different way to talk about the Middle East is what it does in the world of business. Uh, because it's a different angle, which I think a lot of students don't 
don't think about much, uh, but it's a, it's a way in which it's positively engaging the broader world, uh, connecting with multinational companies and the like. So anyway, when we talk about the Middle East, in the Middle East, I know we have one, one colleague here from, uh, from Palestine, uh, so she, she knows this very well. But you know, the thing, when you talk about the Middle East, you know, first of all, the term itself is very nebulous. So when people say the Middle East, what do they really mean by it? I mean, the term came about mainly in the 19th century. It's a British term. Uh, and the, the middle part is actually pretty accurate if you look at kind of world civilizations. And you can sort of see the Arab world sort of being between Europe and Asia and Africa. And so the middle part you get. The east, of course, because it was east of Europe. Um, and the far east, of course, is far from Europe. So th there's nothing particularly Eastern about it, but certainly being centrally located is, is a fair point. Uh, if you talk to, uh, and, and if you look at the, the, the country composition of the Middle East, you'll find many, many countries. Uh, but if you speak with uh, Arabs, or if you kind of look at the Arab world, there really are three clusters uh, that are the, 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 the basic essentials of the Middle East. Uh, and they, so if you speak to, to an, uh, an Arab, uh, Arab person, they'll say, well, you know, what, what do we have in the Middle East? Number one, so the Middle East has a term called Ash-Sharq al-Awsat, which is the Middle East. Uh, and then in the Ash-Sharq al-Awsat, you have uh, Bilad al-Sham is one part. So Bilad al-Sham, which means the countries of Syria, or the provinces of Syria, which is, I don't know if this, this has a pointer. Yeah, this has a pointer. It's called, we call it the Levant uh, in English. And these countries here, they have a, they have a pretty uh, similar culture, language, food, etc. So here you've got Palestine, Jordan, Jordan, Palestine, uh, Israel, of course, Syria, uh, Iraq, um, Lebanon. Uh, and so you've got these countries, uh, and the Bilad al-Sham is, is it's a region. If you talk to somebody and you say, uh, you know, I'm Shami, it means I'm from this part of the world, and it actually it means something. Uh, Jordan versus Palestine is a fairly artificial uh, distinction. Uh, Syria. Uh, has again is a bit you know quite its, its own uh, history, but sort of where Syria ends and Lebanon begins again is a is a matter for um, debate or discussion. But clearly, Bilad al-Sham has a certain identity over here, uh, and then you have Al-Maghrib, which is North Africa. Now, North Africa has its own characteristics. Uh, there's a lot of French influence, of course. The uh, uh, the language uh, is the dialect of Arabic is somewhat different, especially if you go to Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, the co colloquial language that you hear is quite different from what you read in textbooks uh, or from what you hear in uh, the, the Levant. That's a different dialect. So for example, if you ask somebody, if you're in Lebanon and you want to say, hey, how are you, say kifak. Right? If you're in, in the Gulf, you say kef al-hal. Or if you're in Kuwait, you say shlonak. Uh, so kef al-hal is classical Arabic. Shlonak is a nice expression in, Arabic, in uh, Kuwaiti. It means, what is your color, literally. Uh, but it means how you're doing. And kifak is what you would say, which is how are you, literally. Uh, so there's different, different language. But you know, within, uh, within this region of the Levant, it's fairly common. Within North Africa, it's fairly common. Then you have Egypt. I haven't, I haven't taken out Egypt as its own entity. But Egypt is by far the biggest Arab country. It has about 85 million people in it. Uh, for perspective, there are twice as many people living in Egypt uh, as in the entire Gulf combined. So it's a, it's a massive country. Uh, and uh, it, the Egyptians refer to themselves as Umba Dunya, which means the mother, the mother of the world, um, which is nice. I mean, basically, it comes, of course, they have a rich civilization. I'm sure you all teach it, the archaeology and all that. Uh, but also, it has, it has, it's such a big country, and it has so many influences. And, uh, so it's sort of its own cluster by itself. But I've put it in for, to North Africa for simplicity. Anyway, from a business perspective, uh, they, these regions are, are quite different one from the other. So uh, the GCC, which is the Gulf region, uh, minus Yemen. Yemen is geographically part of the Gulf, but it's not part of this union called the GCC, or the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, you see they have a G GDP per capita of about 20,000 US dollars uh, per person per year, which is, by emerging market standards, pretty respectable. Uh, and when you look at North Africa, uh, it's far different. So North Africa is about 6,000. Uh, and the Levant is less than five. Now, the Levant includes Iraq. And at the time this analysis was done, Iraq was obviously in a very, very difficult spot. So that kind of pulls the average down. But nonetheless, you have Iraq, you have Palestine. So you have um, some, some you know, troubles in terms of political, geopolitical issues in this part. Uh, North Africa has its share as well, but 
but uh, less so. And economically, it has some oil, it has some gas, um, and there's a bit of a rebound happening. Uh, but the Gulf is a pretty wealthy place. Uh, so from a business perspective, when people talk about business in the Middle East, really what we mean from a commercial perspective is the Gulf. That's where the most kind of exciting markets are. Uh, from a social perspective, from a historical perspective, uh, from a cultural perspective, clearly those other places are extremely important. And in fact, this is a bit of a digression. But, um, but it used to, you know, I, I used to work at a consulting firm called Monitor. Uh, and we had a, there was a professor from, from uh, Harvard who came to speak uh, to us by the name of Ernest May. Anybody read Ernest May? Ernest May is a historian there. And Ernest May has a very interesting theory about uh, how leaders, he's a historian, so he talks about political leaders. And his perspective is that political leaders act based on a vision of the world as they knew it in their 20s. So if you want to understand what uh, Churchill did in World War II, you have to look at the world as it was in World War I, because that's when he was a young man forming his impressions of the world, and people generally don't move from their impressions. I think it's pretty, pretty accurate, at least in people that I've come across. I think that very much our perceptions are shaped from, from our early adulthood. The reason why I say this is that if you go to Middle Eastern uh, studies departments around the US and probably around the world, uh, what you'll find in terms of people who, who work there are customarily I individuals who are focused in, uh, it's not here anymore, but focused on the Levant region or on Egypt. Because when these professors were doing their doctoral studies, culturally, of course, Egypt is the home of N N Najib Mahfouz, you know, the Nobel Prize winning author. Uh, it's got a lot of good literature, um, and so you'd, you'd study it. And then, of course, uh, Syria and Palestine and Lebanon, again, there's a lot of good history there and culturally very important. So there are very few people, actually, in the academy today who have studied the Gulf, because when they were in school, the Gulf was not very important. Uh, commercially, it's become very important since the 1970s, late 1970s, with the two oil booms. And culturally, frankly speaking, it, it hasn't had much uh, uh, that's been celebrated in terms of cultural contributions, except for being the birthplace of Islam. So from an Islamic perspective, it's, it's studied and it's understood. But very quickly, if you look at the, the history of Islam, it was born in Mecca and, uh, and Medina. So if we go back here, it was born in this part, this part of the world, but very quickly spread you know, far beyond even the region drawn here. And within uh, a couple of generations, you had the Islamic world being ruled from Syria, Syria and Baghdad. So, so that was, uh, very, you know, pretty quickly the Gulf lost its political importance. Um, so anyway, that's, that's an important, uh, if you will, a bit of a digression. But the Gulf is not typically focused on by a lot of academics uh, in the Middle East. Now, from a, from a business perspective, now I know that this, this session was positioned as a case study, uh, which I think is a good way of looking at it. So what, I'm, what I've done here is this is essentially a formula uh, in general for business analysis. So when business people look uh, at an opportunity or look at a region, what is it that they're concerned about and, and what makes them choose to do business in one place versus another? So the first issue, is, of course, is wealth. You know, wealthy countries tend to make more attractive markets for business people. So if you sell automobiles, or if you sell soap, or if you sell cars, uh, if you sell um, you know, uh, appliances, whatever it is, most companies, they, the first thing they look at when they look at a market is GDP uh, overall, but in particular GDP per capita, which is a good way of understanding whether people can afford to buy the goods that they sell. So that's an important one. Now, now the Gulf, from that perspective, is pretty exciting. Uh, as I said, $20,000 per person per year uh, is a pretty respectable GDP per capita, especially by emerging market standards. To put that in perspective, India uh, is five times less than that amount. So India is about 4,000 or so GDP per capita. And, and China is a little bit more, so it's about six. It's about three times that amount, uh, or the one third the amount, sorry. So basically, you know, from a, from a GDP per capita, from a wealth perspective, the Gulf is significantly more attractive than other emerging markets that you hear about. Uh, where it's different, though, is in terms of absolute size. So there are only 40 million people in the Gulf. Uh, that's uh, four zero. So 40 million. Uh, and if you look at India, of course, and China, they have a billion each. So it's much, much bigger market. But in terms of uh, average uh, wealth per person, you find more of it in the Gulf. The second thing that you look at when, from a business perspective, and again, socially, it's, it's, it's also very interesting, is the question of demographics. 
So for people who work in marketing, uh, like, you know, for example, you know, Coca-Cola. Uh, so the main thing that Coca-Cola tries to do or Pepsi tries to do or what these other brands try to do is you try to capture customers when they're young. Because the overriding belief is that a young customer uh, you know, is a good, better one to have because they'll consume longer, they'll develop brand loyalty, etc. So in, when you do uh, business analysis for companies, customarily what you'll do is you'll look at the age group of 15 to 34. For some reason that's what the pollsters and everyone sort of see as, as the sweet spot. So 15 to 34, that's the best kind of customer you can have. Uh, we'll talk about the demographics of the Gulf in a minute, but you'll see that it's a very, very young population, and that, that holds for the Middle East as well. More so for the Gulf than elsewhere, but generally speaking, the Middle East is a very young place. Uh, a lot of young consumers, uh, which from a business perspective is, is attractive. From a, from a social perspective and political perspective, it's quite challenging, um, because obviously those young people need schooling, those people, young, young people need jobs, uh, and they need to become productive members of society. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the demographic story, but it's very important for any market. Um, the next element, of course, for, for business people is regulation. So there are certain, the Gulf actually became very attractive for business in the late 70s and the early 80s, but the issue was that it was very difficult to do business there. Uh, there were prohibitions on owning your own company. So again, within the Gulf I'm talking about, you could not uh, open your own business as a, and have it be owned by a foreigner. So you needed a local partner and that was complex. Uh, and then there were various laws about what you could do and you couldn't do, and so it, it was difficult. Now all of the Gulf states have joined WTO. They're getting more and more open, so it's getting a bit easier, although still it's not completely as easy as, as one would uh, perhaps hope. But nonetheless, regulation is another, another key factor that people look at. So, so the reason why I put this framework here is that in any case, if we're talking about the Gulf or if we're not talking about the Gulf, uh, it's, this is something interesting for, for uh, people to consider is, well, what are the various factors that a company looks at when it's thinking about doing business uh, in, a, in a country? All right, here, this is some of the numbers I've already talked you through. Now, GDP per capita um, is, um, in the U.S., is a you know, very respectable sort of $45,000 or so. Um, and if you look at Japan, it's, it's sort of between 30 and 35. The Gulf, as we said, is nearly 20. Now, China and India, I've already talked about. China is about a, a third of this. India is about a fifth of this. Uh, but if you look at, at the wealth, GDP per capita, of G the GCC, it's sort of like Portugal, right? Now, Portugal is a very respectable country. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I don't know about you, but a lot of young people that I see, when you talk to them about, say, Saudi Arabia, I mean, how, what do they think about people in Saudi Arabia in terms of wealth? Any thoughts? Yeah. Oil shakes, right? Oil shakes and, and, and Rolls Royces and private jets and, you know, fancy jewelry and all that stuff, which, you know, there's, I'm not denying that there are such people. Of course there are. But on an average per basis, it's not wealthier than Portugal, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in terms of the, um, the um, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, social issues or the average man on the street, Saudi Arabia has a lot of issues. Saudi Arabia's unemployment is about 20% uh, in any, if you take any sort of real, real look at it. The official figures are more like, I think, 12 or 15, but in reality, it's more like 20. You have homelessness. You have, uh, you know, you have pretty big issues there. So it's, it's not to say that Saudi is a, a place where everybody is, is wealthy or the streets are paved with gold. Um, but in any case, so this is just for perspective. The Gulf by emerging market standards is pretty, looks pretty good. Compared to India and China, it's, it's a pretty wealthy place. Compared to the U.S., it's not even close. Uh, uh, so you know, we're wealthier on a per capita basis than they are. Now this is, an, this is a nice chart here about population growth or the driver of the population growth. So here on one axis you have lifetime uh, births per, per woman. So on average how many uh, children does a, does a woman have? And on this side it's sort of related to that is how much the population was expected to grow between 2006 and 2050. So if you look at the US, so we have on average two children per, per woman uh, and between now and 2050 we'll be about 40 percent bigger as a country based on projections about how long people will live and the people being born, which is a pretty big, you know, pretty big growth you know, compared to other places. You know, a lot of parts of Europe, for example, if the figure is very different, it would be lower because you have fewer births per woman. Um, 
and therefore the population is not growing as fast. In any case, if you look at Saudi Arabia, it's really frightening. Uh, right? Between four and five births per woman, uh, and the population essentially is going to double. Now, now this is important because you have a similar uh, doubling effect happening in UA the UAE, Kuwait, and Qatar. But from a social perspective, that's not nearly as troubling because these are much more, these are much wealthier states and these are smaller states and they can absorb the growth. Saudi Arabia is a 25, 27 million uh, person country. And that's kind of a, that's a very concerning figure. Um, but in any case, the, the point is that, that from a population growth uh, and a youthfulness of markets, Saudi is, is important as is the rest of the Gulf and quite different from, from the US. Now this is a nice chart here about, uh, this is called an age pyramid. And, and the way, has anyone seen an age pyramid before? Oh, okay, great. So you, you, so you know age pyramids. All right, so if you look at the age pyramid here, basically what we have in, in the US is these are, so you start to see the baby boomers here, the kind of the big bars, uh, and then here are senior citizens. And essentially what you see is the population at, when you get to this point and beyond is more or less regenerating. So we have more, as many people as we have, for example, between uh, 15 and 19, we've got about the same number of people between 10 and 14. So they're all kind of moving in tandem. Now obviously our life expectancy is going up, so the population will still grow. But you know, there's a pretty, pretty stable replacement uh, of the population. If you look at Oman, which is just in one of the Gulf, six countries in the Gulf, uh, GCC, Oman is an interesting example because if the single largest age group is zero to four. So, and it's pretty remarkable. It's worth pausing on. So the single largest age group in the country is between zero and four. And then the next biggest one is right above that. And the next is right above that. And the next is right above that. So here you're talking about countries where majority, a majority of the population, certainly in Oman, is below the age of 15. Um, and the kind of infrastructure that you require, just the social infrastructure, as all of these young people age, they need to go to school. The schools need to be built. The universities need to come. The job training needs to be there. The jobs need to be created. It's, pretty, it's a pretty daunting task. Um, so, so that's an important figure. Yes? And Oman, that's a good question. I, 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 have, I can tell you why, but does anybody have a guess? OK. Uh, it's because uh, in the GCC, there's a fairly common practice of expatriate workers. Uh, so what you have are expatriates, especially from South Asia uh, who come, and, and the Far East, who come to work. And they tend to be men. And they do jobs like construction and taxi drivers and, and the like. And um, uh, unfortunately, they're not customarily allowed to bring their families. So their, their wives and their children are back in Bangladesh or Pakistan or India or, or Nepal or the Philippines, and the men are alone in Oman. So that's what skews it. Over time, you wouldn't expect that. So if you look at the younger bands, of course, you know, get, when they give birth, it's pretty equal. Uh, it's just that, that that's sort of a blip due to the expatriate workers. Uh, so what's going to happen here, I've already discussed this. Uh, sorry? I've already discussed this one, but the idea is that the workforce is going to boom uh, in, or has been booming, uh, in all of the countries of the GCC. I sh I'm sorry, I failed to, I should have named all the countries uh, up front. Here they are. So there's Oman, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, the UAE, and Qatar. These are the six members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, now, uh, so the workforce is going to grow, uh, and that means job creation. Uh, the flip side of this, though, if you look at places like, uh, like Italy, uh, and Northern Europe, there's, there's sort of a reverse problem going on. And even here, I mean, you hear a lot of the, the discussion that we do, that we have around social security, right, is to say that we have more and more people who are going to be on social security, and we have fewer people who are working. Uh, and the idea is that to fund, uh, you know, to fund our retirees, we have a problem because we don't have enough young workers. Uh, in Europe, it's even more severe because the population is not, not growing the same way. Uh, in any case, here in the Gulf, it's the reverse problem. So they have plenty of people to work, uh, but they don't ha and they don't have anybody, very few people on pensions and stuff, so they're very easy to support their pensioners, but it's hard to put their people to work. Um, uh, and so, you know, in net, net in aggregate, sort of the markets, the global market works itself out pretty well, but in any particular country or region, you've got these, uh, these skews. So this is a skew that you find here uh, in the GCC.
Um, now, uh, the, actually, before we get to that, I want to go back for a second before we go to this and tell a quick anecdote about this. I mean, um, I'm sure some of, we didn't talk about a word here, but you may have come across it, uh, which is sovereign wealth funds. Uh, have you ever come across that, that word? Has it, has it come up in your classroom at all, sir? No. Okay. Well, uh, sovereign wealth funds, so basically these are government-owned investment vehicles. And many governments, not many, but several governments worldwide have them. So Singapore has one. It's called Tamasic. Uh, China has several that are making a lot of big investments. Uh, and uh, the Middle East and the Gulf region has a few as well. Now, sovereign wealth funds are essentially investment vehicles by which these countries take advantage of their surpluses. They're, they're very big surpluses. So uh, I think we'll talk about that later on. But basically, when they sell their oil and gas in the market, they get a certain price. Of that price, the bulk of it over the last few years has gone into savings. Uh, and those savings are then invested. So it's a very reverse, it's, you know, opposite problem again to what we see in the US and the UK, where we have been operating at deficits for quite a while. Uh, and part of the, the concern about the bailout packages is that they're, we're perpetuating our deficits. Uh, and it's hard to see when we kind of turn the corner and come back to breaking, e breaking even or having a surplus. So anyway, uh, the anecdote I wanted to tell you is that there's a Kuwaiti entity that I, I'm very fond of, just because of its name. Uh, and it's called the Kuwaiti Fund for Future Generations. Uh, and the idea is that the, the Kuwaiti government uh, said that we are an exceptionally wealthy country uh, because of this natural wealth that we have from oil. And we want all Kuwaitis in the future to live as well as we live. So we're going to stash away some money. And actually, 10% of the oil revenue goes to the Kuwaiti Fund for Future Generations, which is nice, I think. Um, but you know, to this point about uh, we, you know, funding for retirees versus funding for, for future generations, it's, it's, it's a very challenging situation in most of the world. In the GCC, that funding retirees is not hard, but putting people to work is. Um, ease of doing business. Now, from, this is kind of more of a commercial statistic. But, but in terms of regulatory reform, how easy is it to do business in the Gulf, you can see that compared with a lot of other emerging markets, it's actually quite strong. So better than Russia, better than China, better than India uh, on average. Within the Gulf, Saudi is more difficult than Bahrain uh, and the like. So generally speaking, some people think it's difficult to do business uh, in the Middle East. And some countries are easier than others, some are harder. But the Gulf region has been particularly strong in terms of its regulatory reform. Uh, in terms of oil, pro uh, oil price, I mean, uh, the wealth of the Gulf as you pointed out when we were talking about the question, the, the key terms people think of, of, of course, do, has to do with oil. Um, and one interesting thing about, about oil is that not only does it comprise a bulk of GDP for, for many of these countries, but also uh, the more stark aspect of it is that it's the vast majority of, um, of um, government income. So, you know, here when we want to uh, when the government wants to, to adopt new economic policies or programs, what we do is either we raise taxes or we lower taxes. Right? So that's essentially we play with taxes. We also do things with the interest rate. So we raise the interest rate or lower the interest rate to you know, adjust the money supply. But, but what's interesting about the Gulf from a policy perspective is that they don't, essentially they don't have income taxes. There are some taxes here and there, corporate taxes, what have you, but essentially there are no income taxes. So the way that the government funds itself is through oil revenue. When they have a good year, that's fantastic. When they have a bad year, they have to dip into their reserves. But it's a really f fundamental and profound phenomenon, right? Because of course, as, as you all teach, I mean, how many of you teach the American Revolution? Really? I'm surprised. So few? Uh, I guess because you guys are focused on international studies. Is that the idea? All right. Um, but, uh, but the American Revolution, you know, of course, the rallying cry. Uh, behind the Boston Tea Party, which was no taxation without representation. All right, so there's a fundamental link, linkage between economic support of a government uh, and then your right as a citizen to, to hold that government accountable. And part of this, and somebody raised a question about democracy, you know, we're, why we're seeing only very moderate forms of democracy, uh, at least in the Gulf region, I think largely relates to this economic relationship, which is that if you don't, if the government provides for you, 
uh, and it provides fairly well uh, and fair, generously to in, in a lot of the countries of the Gulf, then you, the government sort of has this moral authority to say, well, we take care of you, uh, and therefore, you know, as long as you're being taken care of, it's not your place to meddle uh, in politics. And on the other side, the other way to look at it is if you're paying taxes every year to that government, then certainly you will stand up and say, guys, you know, how are my tax dollars being spent? I need you to tell me, et cetera. In that case, you know, literally, if they pick up the trash in front of your house, it's because they're doing you a favor. Or certainly it's not something you paid for. So it's a very different dynamic between the rulers and the people. Um, and that's a long discussion, so I don't want to get into it more. But, but in any case, uh, the, the oil revenue is the, is the key source of revenue for the government, and that's how they uh, run the state. Uh, what happens, this is a bit complicated, but, but uh, you know, just in simple terms, what happens here is that you get the high, high oil and gas income, um, and that enables uh, governments to have surpluses. So they set a budget, uh, they have more money than they need, then they have to deploy that capital, they do it either internationally or they do it through local, uh, local consumption, local uh, investment. Uh, and these have two main effects. So number one, the Gulf becomes more important in global markets. So you see Gulf companies buying big, big stakes of important companies. So, you know, for example, just you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a major investment uh, so I'm trying to think of some good examples. So, so if we look at uh, Daimler, the ones who make Mercedes-Benz, that's owned about 10% now by a uh, UAE, Abu Dhabi company. Uh, the Chrysler building in New York where I live, that's owned by Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, a lot of our, uh, you know, uh, Gucci, for example. Well, Gucci's Italian, but nonetheless, Gucci was owned by, um, uh, by um, a Bahraini entity. They've sold it subsequently for a profit. Uh, Tiffany's used to be owned by a Middle East investor. So a lot of the, the companies that we're familiar with are actually have significant funding from the Middle East. And even more kind of, and, and I know you're hearing about China and India later, uh, uh, but even more significant is the, the, the treasury notes that these countries hold. So treasury notes are the IOUs written by the US Treasury, uh, and they need to be bought. Uh, and that's what funds, gives liquidity to the U.S. government. So anyway, those, those uh, notes, uh, treasury bills, are essentially the foreign reserve currency of the world. So, you know, all countries around the world have them. But China has a lot, uh, and the Gulf has a lot, disproportionately, uh, because that's where they hold a lot of their wealth. And what that means, sort of in practical terms, is if they got up one day and said, you know what, we're just not so keen about these treasury bills, we want to start dumping them. Then as a result, for the US uh, Treasury to continue getting liquidity, they'd have to raise interest rates. So those interest rates would go up. When the interest rates go up on bonds, then they go up on lending. So our mortgages, for example, those interest rates would go up. Uh, our credit card rates would go up. So it's a pretty significant um, effect that would happen if all of these guys started selling their, their US assets. So in any case, that's important. But what also you see happening uh, is that a lot of the wealth is being channeled to the local economies to make those economies stronger. Um, and that's what's making it more attractive for many to do business. Okay, uh, now with regards to, um, to unemployment, you know, I've already talked about this. In the Gulf, you have three, three of the six GCC countries have double-digit unemployment, uh, them being Bahrain, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and three of them, Qatar, the UAE, and Kuwait, have basically no unemployment. You know, very little unemployment. So that's a good thing. And this is why I said before, the fact that the population is growing in those wealthier countries, not as much of a problem. But it is a problem with the first three. Um, now this is, an, uh, you know, one misconception that people have about the Gulf, of course, is that, is, and the Middle East in general, is that women are uh, sort of not, they don't play a central role in the economy and in decision-making processes and the like. Uh, now, the statistic I have here might be surprising to some, but more than half of college students in the Gulf are women. Um, uh, and these women obviously are getting their degrees and then they're entering the workforce. And it's quite interesting because when they enter the workforce, again, this is purely from a business perspective, they are very, um, they're very kind of attractive, if you will, customers 
because customarily in, in, in uh, Middle Eastern culture, uh, uh, women and men both, but more so women, don't leave their parents' home until they get married. Right? So if you imagine somebody who's working a job, uh, who has a, you know, a decent income, but she has no rent to pay, she, if she might have a car, uh, she has a cell phone. But basically all of what she's earning goes for her personal consumption. So you find a lot of uh, young women in the GCC, some of them are saving, but, uh, and a lot of them are also are consuming. So they're buying nice handbags, they're buying fancy cars, they're buying these things. So in any case, that's a, it's an important market. Um, and from, from a decision-making perspective, there's still a long way to go. So the Gulf you know, really needs to do much more to bring, uh, to bring women into leadership roles and, and make it easy for them uh, to have equal access. But you know, you're starting to see some very good signs. So I used to work for a consulting firm called the Boston Consulting Group. And we were doing a project in the UAE. And some of our partners were concerned, saying, well, you know, when we send our female colleagues to do business there, how will they be received? Uh, and so, you know, first of all, it's, 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 it's a very, uh, I mean, if you've seen pictures of Dubai and if you know, read about Dubai, and you'll know that it's, it's a very open place uh, in that respect. But more fundamentally, uh, it was nice because our client was the Minister of Economy for the UAE, and she was a woman. Uh, and her, Lubna Al-Qasimi is her name. And she's the, she was the Minister of Economy, now she's the Minister of Foreign Trade. So there are women in the cabinet, they have female ambassadors, uh, and it's getting a bit better, but you know, there's still a long way to go. The good news is at the educational level, there's clearly equal access to education, um, and uh, we're seeing that play out in the universities, which is good. Not necessarily true uh, all around uh, the, the Middle East and all around the Islamic world, uh, but in the Gulf, the story is pretty, pretty positive. Now these are just nice images um, of products here. These are obviously all brands that you recognize uh, and how they're marketed in the Middle East and in, uh, uh, overall as well as in the Gulf. Now one misconception, which I think is pretty much going away now, but you remember from um, you know, right after the post 9-11 sort of days, you know, President Bush used to talk a lot about how, or used to say, why do these people hate us? You know, and the idea that they, they, being sort of a nebulous sense of who they are, but sort of the Middle East, they, they sort of, they, they have a aversion towards the US. They hate everything American. They hate our freedom. They hate our uh, way of life, et cetera. Uh, in terms of our way of life, it's very hard to make that case because they consume a lot of our products. Right? They buy our brands, they drink our soda, they wear our jeans, they send their kids to our universities. Uh, so in terms of, from a consumption perspective, the, the perception of the US and US brands are very, very positive. What's not as positive, or has not been historically as positive, is the kind of political perspective on US foreign policy. Um, and I think, you know, with, this, with the president's speech in Egypt, hopefully that'll be a step in the right direction and things will improve. But clearly there's, not, there's no mass aversion towards all things American. Uh, not even in you know, Saudi Arabia, which is seen as a, as a more hostile state vis-a-vis um, the U.S. Uh, politically, but in terms of consumption, the consumption is very, very high of American goods. Uh, and that's what we're showing here. Um, this is a nice little image. Of course, you all recognize the, the, the golden arches here. Uh, and uh, you know how we, they have the tagline, I'm loving it, right? Is, uh, which is, you must not like because it's grammatically uh, incorrect, right? I'm loving it. Yes, sir. Oh, he's eating with both hands. I think he's eating with both hands. Both hands is okay. Yeah, that's a good point. In the, in the Middle East, it's, it's not considered proper to eat with your left hand. So you should eat with your right hand, but you can eat with both hands. That's okay. But if it's, if it's only one hand, it should be the right. And same thing with drinking. You should drink from your right hand. Uh, anyway, but so this is a nice picture. You've got a, 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 a this is an ad is from Saudi Arabia. It's a Saudi family, but it could be anywhere in the Gulf. Uh, and they're here at McDonald's and they're having a meal. And what's really nice about this, if any of you read Arabic, it says, uh, this is from the time of mad cow disease. So what it the, the tagline, the headline here is that uh, high quality is our only standard, meaning all of our food is high quality. And then the first line here, it says, in, uh, the meats that we use, uh, that McDonald's uses, are halal. I don't know if you're familiar with, are you familiar with the term halal? 
So halal means they're Islamically permissible. So that's a point that they raise. It's actually interesting they say that first. Uh, and then they say it is the best uh, type of uh, cow meat uh, that is purely 100% beef. Uh, so on and so forth. So anyway, it talks about how they don't have mad cow issues. That's really the impetus for this ad. But it's nice because you see this, this, this Arab family. You see the, the boy and the girl and the mother and the father. Uh, and this is sort of, uh, you know, it's interesting because it, it's the, if you will, the American way, but more sort of circa 1955. <laughs> right? In the sense that not, not many people today would say that the ideal family outing is a, is a trip to McDonald's. It's sort of kind of been seen as down market. But, but anyway, this is not so different from the culture that, that we're familiar with. All right, this is uh, no need to talk about this in detail. But what we have here is the whole um, marketing uh, approach. So how you customize products. And this is not, again, not specific to the Gulf. So this is something you could use for any country. And you're talking later about China and India. Uh, and um, you, know, you could use the same thing over there, which is to say that you, sorry? Right, this is not particular to the Gulf. This is, this is just a framework around marketing. So first of all, there are some, some, uh, some products that are not customized at all when you market them. So for example, French shampoos, uh, or French, sorry, French perfumes, um, Italian purses and stuff like that. I mean, I guess part of the appeal is that this is Italian or it's French or German or what have you. So you actually wouldn't, if you were trying to market that in the Gulf or anywhere, again, China, India, Russia, Africa, you would say, you know, this, you would keep the marketing as it is. Uh, then you've got this message about, <clears throat> the point about adapting the message. So that's what most, most goods and, and services do. We, we, I, I just showed you Pepsi, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Coke and Sprite and Crest. So customarily what's done is you'll take your uh, universal branding, you'll translate it to Arabic language because that's important. Um, and then what you'll do is, uh, you know, you'll market it with a pretty similar um, set of themes. So for example, uh, and there's a, I have a table of this in, in Dubai and Co. If, if you're interested in looking at it in detail. But you know, HSBC, their tagline is the world's local bank. In Arabic, it's Al Bank Al Muhalli uh, Al Alami, which is a basically literal translation. Uh, if you look at, um, um, there's a really nice one, is uh, I think it was Ford used to have their, their um, tagline as drive. It was just drive. Uh, and what they've said in Arabic is Tawalla Al Qiyada, or Tawalli Al Qiyada, which is, uh, it, means to, it means take, literally means take the lead. It also, Al Qiyada is also driving. So it's, a pretty, it's fairly literal. But what's nice about it is if you, said to, if you would say drive, it, would say, it means siq. You would say siq in Arabic, which is, uh, which is not a very pleasant thing to say to somebody. Uh, drive, it's a bit rude. So they've actually made it more, more positive by adopting it. So it's nice. Um, anyway, so that's what the custom is. The custom is to take your tagline, make it a little bit different, um, and translate it into Arabic. Um, uh, adapting the portfolio, this is about kind of introducing um, or, or sort of changing your mix of products for, uh, for that region. Now, one thing is, how many of you shop at Zara? Can we shop at Zara? Yeah. Uh, um, well, Zara, it's very interesting. So my wife and I went to, uh, we were on one of our trips to the Middle East, and my wife was saying how she really loves shopping at Zara uh, in the Middle East. Because my wife, so my wife wears a hijab, uh, and so she wears long sleeves. Uh, and finding long sleeve shirts is not easy uh, if you go to a, a mall uh, in the States. It's pretty difficult to find you know, kind of long sleeve stuff, especially that's light for the summer. So she always had a hard time, she has a hard time buying stuff. Anyway, when she went to Zara in the, in the, in the Gulf, it was really easy. So it intrigued me, because you go there, you see all of these long skirts, you see these nice long shirts, like flowery prints. So I was, so I was surprised. So I said, you know, I, I really want to investigate this, because this is, this is pretty, pretty cool. I mean, they must have done some research or whatever. Turns out it's actually not particularly sophisticated. Or I should say it's not, it's not deliberate, but it is sophisticated, because what Zara, Zara's whole uh, merchandising strategy is that they, they, they design a lot of products. So they have more variety than like, you know, the Gap or Ann Taylor or, you know, other such, uh, such designers. Um, 
And then what they do is whatever sells, they make more of. It just seems pretty, pretty logical, right? Uh, whatever sells in a particular store, they bring more of that stuff. So anyway, so what they found is that these were products that they actually didn't create for the Middle East. They actually created these products for global use. But because they were selling well in the Middle East, more and more of them were ending up on the racks in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, which was pretty clever. Um, and I think, again, it's sort of, that's an example of not making anything specially for the region, but sending them the stuff that works for them. And the last is to create market-specific products and services. And in, in, in uh, financial services, we do this a lot because of uh, Islamic banking, which I don't think we have time. I'm checking the time here. We're not going to talk much about Islamic banking. Um, but uh, essentially, it's, it's financial services in accordance with Islamic law. And f to create those products, you need to do some customization. So most of the big banks in the world have done so. HSBC, Citibank, uh, Deutsche Bank, um, uh, Credit Suisse, the whole, you know, most, almost all of the European banks, and then, as I said, a couple of American banks. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a way that you can customize for the market. Some, some categories require it, most of them don't. And that's, if you're really serious about doing business in the Gulf, you can do that. Now, another misconception about the Middle East, or particularly about the Gulf, would be that everybody there is Arab. Now, of course, in the Arab world, the majority of people are Arab, hence <laughs> the Arab world. <laughs> uh, but, but in the GCC, it's really interesting. Half of the countries of the Gulf are actually majority expatriate. Expatriate means non-citizens. So within the expatriates, of course, there is a very large segment of Arabs, but there are also a lot of non-Arabs, South Asians, uh, uh, Far East Asians from you know, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc. So you have a pretty diverse mix. Now the reason why I say this is that if you're a company that sells, let's see, what would be a good example? Um, uh, what's a good example? Let's say, all right, uh, ties, right? So I mean, as you saw in the picture, you know, most um, Gulf business people, when they go to work, they don't wear suits and ties, right? They wear their traditional clothes. Uh, so the, you would think, well, why do people need to buy ties? First of all, there are a lot of expats who wear suits every day to work, so they need to wear ties. So you would sell your ties nonetheless. And then plus, obviously, these same uh, Middle Easterners, when they travel, they, they wear Western clothing, so that's, that's another reason. But a lot of the things, you know, if you have an Australian brand or if you have a, a German brand, you, you can sell it in the Middle East because there are a lot of Germans and there are a lot of Australians who like those products. Yes, ma'am. Sure. All right, so expatriate, so, so the question was, how do you define expatriate? Is it first generation, fourth generation, et cetera? Now, one of the major problems uh, in the GCC, if you ask my personal opinion, is that there is no process of naturalization. Um, meaning, uh, you can live in the Gulf for your entire life as a foreigner. And I know people like this, who've worked there 30 years, 40 years. The day their job finishes, they're gone. Uh, no nationality, no citizenship, no permanent residence. It's really bad, in my opinion. And it's quite interesting, again, I'll go off, off, off topic, but um, I think it's relevant, is that I, so I happen to be in Riyadh uh, on Inauguration Day in Saudi Arabia, which is interesting. I obviously I would have preferred to be here in Chicago, uh, but, uh, or in DC, um, but I was in, uh, I was in Riyadh. So anyway, what was really interesting is everybody, all of the people in the Middle East were so excited, as you know, internationally, that we have a fresh face, new leadership, you know, new posture towards the world. So it was, it was overall, everything was really great. Um, uh, so I was speaking with one of my, my Saudi friends, and I said, you know, tell me what would have happened if uh, Barack Obama's father had migrated to Saudi Arabia instead of the US? Where do you think Barack Obama would be today? And to your question, to your point, ma'am, first of all, he would never have been a citizen. If he were born in Saudi, he would not have been a citizen. In terms of employment, of course, he could get a job, but it wouldn't be uh, sort of you know, senior enough level. It would be a senior job, but it wouldn't necessarily be running a company. Uh, in terms of politics, of course, no access to politics because you're not a citizen. It's a very different social model. Um, in any case, so to your point, so expatriate means anybody who's not a citizen. Most of them are people who moved it within their lifetime. Uh, some of them, are, of course, are children. Uh, my wife was, uh, or is, 
the daughter of expatriates who were living in Saudi. Uh, and she, what happens is once you reach uh, kind of high school, college age, you leave and you never go back. Um, so that's, that's what customarily happens. But so it's mostly, I guess you would say, first generation uh, immigrants, actually is probably the right term. They're all immigrants. Uh, and then, you know, a few of them are born there, but, but most of them are not. Um, all right. Uh, so that's the GCC uh, in terms of the, the uh, ethnic break breakup. Now, forgive this, this, this chart. It's a bit uh, simplistic. But the, it's a, the point we're trying to make here is that, you know, if you look at the, the world's great uh, civilizations, customarily, the way they've evolved is there's a sort of what we call sustained institutional development. So to use the example of the, of the UK or Britain, you know, you have uh, the universities, so they establish Oxford, they establish these various institutes. You've got the scientific method. Uh, the scientific method feeds the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution sort of, you know, because they experiment with things, they know how to make machines, they make machines, those machines are more productive. Then after the Industrial Revolution, you've got uh, kind of urbanization, uh, and then there's technology that comes with that. So you've got a pretty stable, um, or at least the way we, you know, way we've been taught it, you have this development of in tandem between economic development and social development. Um, and that's, that's generally the way things work, and these, these two reinforce one another. What happened in the Gulf, it was, was a very different story. So you had a pretty, pretty moderate level, uh, modest level, I should say, of economic development, and then you had these oil booms. Um, and in these oil booms, you end up with very wealthy countries that don't have the social infrastructure that customarily comes with wealth. So what do I mean? Universities, in the 70s, there were none to speak of. Uh, literally, there was hardly any university. The great universities of the Arab world are in Egypt, are in Damascus, in Iraq. Um, uh, there, uh, there, there are plenty of great universities uh, in the Arab world, but they're, they're not in the, in the GCC. They're not in the Gulf. Um, and you, so anyway, they didn't have the universities. They didn't have the research institutions. They didn't have the, uh, the civil society we're used to seeing, you know, the various associations and the clubs and the and all that. They didn't have museums. Um, artwork was there, but less developed. So in any case, it's what's, what you find. <clears throat> and the best example I would point to for this is if you, is if you look at Qatar, or Qatar as it's often pronounced, but Q-A-T-A-R, uh, um, then you know, what they're doing now is they're, they're, they've entered into partnerships with a bunch of US universities, such as Georgetown, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, to bring them over uh, to develop campuses there. They're starting uh, museums and cultural venues. They had these Doha debates uh, that someone was referring to before. So they're trying to build that up. Uh, but it's an interesting phenomenon. I think sociologically, when you look at it, it uh, it's, you see it here, um, that they, had to, they didn't have the institutions, but they had the wealth. Um, all right, so this is, uh, this is more, I'll skip this one because this is more of a business uh, one. The, the, the next slide, this one here, is about how companies do business in the Gulf customarily. So <clears throat> very quickly, there are three basic levels that you have. The first, the most common, is what I call here kind of shallow engagement, which is that most, most products that you find uh, that you're familiar with here, most of them you'll find available in the Gulf, but they'll be sold through distributors. So for example, all of the uh, pharmaceuticals uh, all the, the prescription drugs are available, but customarily through a distributor. Then the next level are joint ventures and partnerships. So this is when you go into the market, you find a partner, you start a company together. And the last uh, is when you enter the market directly. Either you go there, you set up your own office, or you buy a company that exists there. That's not, uh, that hasn't happened as much historically. It's starting to happen more. And the main reason why that's happening more is that the UAE in particular, then followed by Qatar uh, and Kuwait and Bahrain, uh, they have these free zones now. So they have areas where you can establish <coughs> a business and own it yourself as a foreigner. And that's making it easier for companies like the banks, like Microsoft, like Hewitt Packer, Packer <coughs> um, to, uh, to be in the market. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to talk about the crisis. Right, tomorrow is the crisis day? So, 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 I mean, we won't need to, I won't talk about it in, in, de in uh, detail here. But basically, 
uh, you know, I talked about these three levels of the three parts of the opportunity formula, wealth, demographics, and uh, reform. <clears throat> What's happening in Subway in the Gulf, the wealth has been uh, contracted. Now, how much, it, it, you know, really, if you follow oil prices, they're very volatile. So today, uh, yesterday, I don't remember. I think it was probably in the high 60s. But yesterday, they lost a lot of value. Oil lost a lot of value. High 60s. Uh, just to give a perspective on that, I don't think I have a slide, so let me give some perspective on this. So when oil trades at uh, about $55 a barrel, uh, then Saudi Arabia has enough money to meet its budget. So 55 is break even for them. Um, when oil is trading at uh, you know 100, for example, that that means 45 dollars per barrel of surplus, pretty significant. When if you look at other countries, it's actually much lower. So the UAE is about 25 dollars a barrel. So everything above 25 is savings, um, and Qatar is even lower than that. So these guys, is, so basically, uh, the oil price uh, is very important, and. The, uh, they can make, uh, they can have a, a surplus uh, at oil prices in the range of sort of uh, 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, but really, the biggest market by far is Saudi Arabia. And for them, it's a $55 or so break even. So it's pretty important for them to keep the oil price above 55. Um, oh, sorry, I, just another thing on this. The demographics obviously don't change. So, um, so you know, it's still young. Uh, whether they're, they're getting new wealth to support those young people uh, or not, they still have them there, yeah. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I think on that point, so the, the gentleman was asking about, he was citing some stories about expats who lost their job in the Gulf and then uh, had debts and ended up in debtor's prison. Now, <laughs> that has happened. That's definitely, I mean, I've read about it as well, and I, and I believe it's true. Uh, I mean, I think it's... Um, uh, so that, that has happened. Uh, and it's been very embarrassing, actually. Uh, so I, I don't think it's happening anymore. But it, was, it definitely did happen. And I read a story about a Canadian woman. It was very tragic. So her husband had fallen ill. He lost his job. And so that they fell into debt and they couldn't leave the country. I mean, the reason for that, I mean, again, this is not to justify it, but the reason for it uh, is that because they have the expats, uh, uh, so many expats, and when the expats leave, there's no claim that they have on their property. So you know, over here, when you go from state to state or whatever, or you, know, you have your credit rating and it follows you, so there's some comfort that if you breach a contract, there will, be, there will be recourse to your assets. Because these are sovereign countries, if an American goes to Dubai and leaves with a ton of debt, then essentially the creditor will not get his money back. Um, that doesn't mean you throw people in prison, but it does mean that you need some mechanism. The easiest thing that they could do, which would be much smarter, uh, it would be to link up with your credit bureaus uh, back home. So, so that, you know, that those Americans or Canadians should be able to leave, but then when they get back to Canada, they should have difficulty getting a new mortgage until they pay off the old one, which is only fair to their creditors. But, but going into jail is a bit, is a bit uh, extreme. Um, uh, so yes, now, but you talked talk about protectionism. Protectionism is there, uh, and I think you know, the general trend has been towards reform or openness, now I'm afraid we might start to see more, more protectionist pressures. It's not sh clear if that, it'll turn out that way. There are a few test cases that we're looking at uh, that should give us a sense. The most interesting one to me is in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, they're creating a bunch of economic cities, uh, but they haven't uh, specified whether these would be free zones or not. Um, and if they're not free zones, that means that only Saudis can, can uh, start up companies there, which would help the Saudis. It's not necessarily a bad thing but it wouldn't be as useful for international business. Um, all right. Now, this point here, uh, and this, I, I think this is more for me to kind of leave it uh, with you as a uh, placeholder for tomorrow when you talk about the crisis. Because I, I, I don't know, of course, how it will be discussed, but there are policymakers or government officials have two kinds of tools to respond to, uh, to changes in the environment, uh, right? There's monetary policy and there's fiscal policy. So monetary policy is things like raising the interest rate or lowering the interest rate or issuing new treasury bills or own, buying back treasury bills. That's what's called open market um, uh, transactions or activities. Um, now, 
the, uh, in the Gulf, they have a big problem with this because their currencies are all pegged to the US dollar, with the exception of Kuwait. So what that means is that the interest rate essentially is set by Ben Bernanke. <laughs> um, uh, and this has been historically uh, sometimes good, sometimes a problem. So where it has been a problem is that their inflation rate has been quite high because their interest rates are low. Um, and typically when you have high inflation, what you do is you want to raise your interest rate. But they can't raise their interest rates because they're pegged to the dollar. So essentially the dollar rate is what, what governs. So that's important. So uh, if they want to contract or expand the economy, they can't do much on the monetary side. On the fiscal side, <coughs> there's some, they, you know, they have some flexibility, right? So obviously they can scale back or, inc or, or increase the benefits they give people. Politically, it's very difficult, uh, as we see everywhere. You know, once you give a benefit to someone, the French are having this problem. Right? When you give benefits, it's very hard to take them back. So although theoretically there's some flexibility, it's quite difficult to convince people that that's, you know, to accept that, especially as we talked about politically, when you don't give a lot of political participatory rights to people, then uh, at minimum what they expect is whatever benefits they've been getting should remain. So they don't have that much flexibility there. But where they do have uh, uh, flexibility is in government investment. So they can either invest, they can put money into the economy, uh, you know, what we talked about here, the stimulus package. <clears throat> so they can have, they do have their own stimulus packages to invest in power plants and roads and highways and <clears throat> um, other projects that will create jobs for their locals. And that, that's, that's where they have flexibility. But what's interesting, again, is that if you compare, compare what a, uh, a Gulf leader is able to do uh, versus what a UK or a US or a, a Western European leader is able to do in terms of leverage to pull, they have fewer. Uh, and that's it. I, I, I want to leave enough time for Q&A. So um, uh, this is my contact information in case you have more questions or want to discuss anything. Um, uh, but uh, I'm actually more interested in hearing your, your questions. So we'll just pause here and I uh, thank you for your attention. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you look, look at these three here, these three factors, Iran, in terms of prosperity, is less prosperous. Uh, it does have natural uh, resources, which provide some degree of wealth, but it's not, um, it's not as wealthy. Uh, in terms of the demographics, it's, it's also a very young population. Um, and so that, in that regard, it, I think it's, it's, it's not, as young as, as the Gulf, but it's, I think you have a similar trend there. In terms of regulation, that's where you have the big difference. I mean, I, I, we don't talk about Iran much from a business perspective, simply because we're not allowed to do business there, right? US entities are not allowed to do business there. As a result, most Europeans will not do business there because they, they can't partner with Americans and stuff on that. So it's a very closed economy. And I think a lot of what you're seeing now in terms of the frustration, I mean, I've never been to Iran, so I can't, I can't speak firsthand, but people who have been there tell me that it's a very, uh, it's a very difficult place, not just because of the things we read about uh, in terms of um, you know, the religious rules and all that, but just there aren't a lot of opportunities. Uh, and people want opportunities. They want to be able to travel. They want to be able to find new jobs. They want to be able to, to prosper. So I think um, there, you know, in that regard, it, it's, it's quite different. But, you know, I, I've never done business there. I can't speak much more beyond that. But those are, those are my impressions. Yeah? Yeah, the question was about the, the athletic events that have been held there in terms of golf and tennis. And, and also in Qatar, they had the Asian Games uh, in 2006, I believe. They had the, hosted the Asian Games. Uh, so they're trying to build their profile. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of them, the, the, the Gulf region, trying to, 
uh, be um, engage in the kind of global cultural uh, identity. I mean, I think that right now there there are, you know, as I think with any uh, global culture or any culture, there are competing tensions. So on the one hand, there's a push to position the Gulf uh, and the Arab world as sort of world class and sophisticated. Uh, so things like you know having Tiger Woods go there and play golf, uh, which he does, and he has a golf course over there. So that's kind of a way of, of positioning themselves as legitimate, world class, you know, good enough for Tiger Woods. What you don't see uh, as much as from the Gulf is sort of cultural pro products of the Gulf being taken outside with some degree of, if you will, pride, right? So, you know, like for example, India, you've got some dog millionaire and all that, right? Which is to say, look, this is a Western uh, movie. It's won an, it won an Oscar for Best Picture. It's about India. India produces culture. You obviously Bollywood before that. India produces a lot of culture that's consumed outside. In terms of the production of, of Arab culture that is then used outside the Arab world, is not as much, but it happens outside of the Gulf, right? So Egyptian films, Egyptian novels, they are pretty, pretty widely read and people appreciate them, especially in Europe. Um, uh, and in, within the Gulf, they're just starting to do that. And the way they're doing it now is they're essentially bringing in expertise from outside uh, and then focusing it on the local market and, and taking it out. But I think that's going to be the more interesting side. Today, what they're trying to do more of is sort of show that they can attract the world, world class events. Yeah? No, and so, so I mean, I, the, the question was about the social, social aspect, social culture, um, uh, and you were saying your observation is a lot of it seems high end. What we're talking about here. Um, now, to to address your your comment, I think it's, it's there are several aspects to it. Now, one is in terms of culture. So, if your if your question is sort of what to what degree is there a common culture? Because you talked about how their expat populations are very large. I mean, what I've seen. Uh, and I think what's common in the Gulf is that you essentially have a pretty fragmented popular culture uh, and fragmented by uh, ethnicity or national origin. So the, the, um, obviously in any country, the locals will have their circles. But for example, the Egyptians will hang out with other Egyptians. The Indians will hang out with other Indians. The Indians who live in Dubai, for example, uh, will, it, it's a lot, I mean, if you see the way that they behave, the way they eat, what they do, it's a lot like they were in India. They read Indian papers, they speak an Indian language. They... So what's interesting about that is essentially you've got an, an amalgamation of, of cultures. What has not yet been formed is really a um, uh, kind of a common social culture that, that goes across all of the, all of the uh, nationalities. Uh, so that's there. Now, what does that mean for business? I mean, you said, you, you know, this is a lot of high-end stuff. There is also the general mass consumer uh, marketing. But the reason why a lot of American companies haven't focused on that is because the market size is not that big. So 40 million is about the size of California from a you know, number of people perspective. So, so that's why they haven't, if, if you have to make something specifically for the Gulf, then you, know, you may not do it because the market's not that huge. It's not like China or India in that respect. Um, but I think then the angle again is more for Getting those, if you want to market to those expats, it's sort of a home country type proposition. So the Indians, uh, for example, or the, 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 let's say the Russians living in uh, the UAE watch Russian satellite TV. They, I presume they drink Ru Russian vodka. Uh, they speak the Russian language. So that's, you know, it's, it's kind of a little pocket of Russia within, within the Middle East, which is uh, you know, uh, interesting for us, very different from what we're used to. Um, 
Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much.